B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Tuesday, January 15th, 2019. For self-employed persons, you better mail a check to the IRS and your state tax authorities. Uh, there's nobody there at the Fed to take your money. But if you don't send it, somewhere down the line, they'll, uh, they'll catch up with you. So we are seeing on almost a daily basis a new figure from the Democratic Party. Either says, I'm about to announce for president, or I have. And it is already producing the kind of progressive infighting that we saw in 2016. And I personally would like to snuff it out right here, right now. And I call for an end to identity politics. There are a whole bunch of women who are running for president this year. I think each one of them has something to offer, something to contribute, and each one comes with some baggage. And if you talk about the baggage, especially on Facebook, you're going to get attacked. You're going to be called out as attacking that candidate by a supporter of that person. And I saw a post over the weekend where Stephen Zunas, who's a Facebook friend, he's a professor at the University of San Francisco, well qualified to comment on foreign policy and many other issues. And he appears to favor Elizabeth Warren at this point. And he raised questions about California freshman Senator Kamala Harris and her foreign policy positions. And a female posted... I don't need your mansplaining. Suggesting that it's off limits for a white male professor to have an opinion about a woman running for president, including a woman of color, and that his views are unwelcome. Because, what, women are special? They get a a bubble, a kind of protection... And this was the very annoying tactic that was used by Hillary Clinton supporters in 2016. Any criticism of Hillary by Bernie, by Bernie supporters, just by an average American, was an attack, a weaponization. We saw that language get used so freely. And it set up some of the blowback that made Trump more appealing I know that's hard to imagine to certain voters who otherwise might have held their nose and voted for Hillary Clinton. And so I ask you, particularly my listeners who are female, don't attack people who criticize your favored candidate. Instead, go and, and, you know, you can respond to them. And say, I don't agree with you, and here are five reasons why. And at this point, I'm not going to take any favorites or any positions. I think Bernie Sanders has a bit of a leg up because of his run in 2016 and because of his his appeal beyond the Democratic Party. But he's getting older. He's seen it as, as a retread when there are many new faces. And so I am not locked in, locked down, or committed. But I find it infuriating when people don't allow honest debate and exchange of views. And I hope that will stop. I know it won't, but (laughs) I had to say something. You understand, right? So we've got Bernie. We've got Biden. We have Beto. We have Sherrod Brown. That's a lot of Bs. Eric Swalwell is a not-so-well-known congressman from the East Bay here in the San Francisco area. Eric Garcetti is the mayor of Los Angeles. Mike Bloomberg, former mayor of New York. We have Joaquin Castro. I'm sorry, Julian Castro. Julian, the former mayor of San Antonio. It's his brother, Joaquin, who is in the House of Representatives right now. And then the female so far, Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren. Gillibrand of New York, Kirsten, I'm sorry, I couldn't summon her first name there right away, and Tulsi Gabbard, the Iraq War veteran who's been serving from Hawaii since 2012. And uh, I think, as I said, each of these people 
bring something to the table. I personally don't support Bloomberg or, or Garcetti or Biden. But I want to hear what everybody has to say. And I want to see who will articulate a progressive path forward, a clear understanding of foreign policy, and the ability to beat Trump in 2020. Those are my criteria. And if every little criticism of a female is、uh, labeled misogyny, well, the Democrats will, well, they'll, they'll have a division sown and not by Moscow. <laughs> so there's a good profile of Tulsi Gabbard by Kevin Gostola at Shadowproof today. I've linked to it and I encourage you to read it because I do respect her for her strong articulation on foreign policy. She spoke out under Obama and under Trump. She went to Syria. While she was there, she was invited by Bashar al Assad to meet, and she met with him.、And、that is now depicted by her critics as、uh, supporting Assad. And because she didn't immediately support the retaliation after questionable reports of the use of chemical weapons by the Assad military, Tulsi Gabbard is seen as soft by parts of the increasingly hawkish. Democratic mainstream. She also is critical of Obama and Clinton on the Libya policy. Quote, After we led the war to topple Gaddafi, we have open human slave trading going on, an open market. In today's society, we have more terrorists in Libya today than there ever were before. She has opposed weapons sales to Saudi Arabia. And she's not perfect. The issues that I'm concerned about are her relationship to India. And I don't criticize her Hindu faith, but that appears to be an element of it. And her connection to the current leader over there, Modi. And it's also suggested here that she、uh, is not unalterably opposed to torture. And there are other issues where I want to hear more from Tulsi Gabbard, but I don't want to hear it from people who are defending her because she's female. I want to hear it from her, and, you know, supporters can certainly second it and accentuate the things that you think matter. But here's a comment she had about Democrats and self described progressives. You have these individuals and groups who call themselves progressives, but are some of the first to call for more war. In the guise of humanitarianism, they look at these poor people suffering, and there are people suffering in other parts of the world. Let's go drop more bombs and try to take away their suffering. And when you look at example after example after example, our actions, U.S. policy, interventionist regime change, war policy, has made the lives of people in these countries far worse than they ever were before or would have been if we had just stayed out of it. Now, I consider that to be real wisdom. From a woman who's still in her 30s. And so I can put aside my negative perceptions of certain aspects of Tulsi Gabbard. And again, we got plenty of time. The primaries don't start till next year. So let's let these people wow us, impress us. We got Beto in the dentist chair shooting videos. Okay. <laughs> Bring it on, Beto. <laughs> Uh, and when Beto's record was examined by Norman Solomon and David Sirota, we had goons like uh, David uh, Brock from、uh, Media Matters fame and Nira Tandon from the Center for American Progress saying, Whoa, you can't do that. So get this they silence progressives saying, You can't question Beto O'Rourke's record. And then on the cable shout shows, There are no progressive voices invited. And Jeff Cohen, my friend who is one of the co founders of Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, FAIR, he's a retired college professor. At Common Dreams the other day, he said corporate media bias on 2020 Democratic race already in high gear. And he notes that when you watch cable news, they present the party establishment as one wing of the Democratic Party. And then they talk about the activist base, animated by issues and allied with elected officials like Sanders and a young crop of insurgent Congress members. But 
as Cohen points out, strange thing. Only the corporate Democratic side is regularly represented on MSNBC and CNN. And MSNBC doesn't cover the fracture in the Democratic Party. It's all anti-Trump 24-7. And there are plenty of issues that Democrats would like to hear discussed. You know, like what's going on in Congress and, you know, will the BDS bill actually pass? But MSNBC doesn't share that with us. Their ratings have gone up as they've been on the Trump marathon, telethon, telenovela. <laughs> Back to Cohen here. The absence of pundits firmly allied with the progressive wing of the party leads to unrebutted establishment cliches, such as Democrats are too progressive, can't win the votes of moderate and swing voters. And then he rebuts that. He says if genuinely progressive pundits were present in mainstream media, they'd argue that anti-corporate populist candidates are often better positioned to win a large portion of swing voters. By definition, swing voters are not heavily political, partisan, or ideological. They are assuredly not activists for feminism or Black Lives Matter. But in 2016, Bernie never shrank from his strong support of civil rights, abortion rights, gay rights, and he was capable of winning swing votes that Hillary could not. Yet in major news outlets, the truism remains that moderate Democrats, meaning corporate cozy non-populists, have a better chance of winning in swing states or districts. And one more quote from Cohen. Let's be clear. One reason mainstream journalists were so wrong about the 2016 election is because they are largely divorced from poor and working class voters of all races. They seem especially clueless about non-college educated whites which may explain their obsession with a group of swing voters they can better relate to, moderate Republicans in the suburbs. Thanks, Jeff Cohen. Good comments there. Now, this Saturday, there will be women's marches in Washington and around the country. But many of those presidential candidates who I just named on the Democratic side are busy elsewhere. They've decided not to participate. And I'm sorry to see fractures in the ranks of the organizers of the Women's March. And so the DNC, Emily's List, Southern Poverty Law Center, they've backed away from the Women's March. And they also say that the reason is that some of the organizers, and in particular co-founder Tamika Mallory, are displaying anti-Semitic commentary or views. Now, some of this is guilt by association because Mallory attended the Nation of Islam's annual Savior's Day and Louis Farrakhan made a series of anti-Semitic and anti-gay remarks, which were partly repudiated by the Women's March organizers. Quote, Minister Farrakhan's statements about Jewish, queer and trans people are not aligned with the Women's March unity principles. But other people wanted to have a full-throated condemnation of Farrakhan. And that divides African Americans who then retaliated and when they were accused of embracing an anti-Semitic expression by Farrakhan, they pushed back and talked about the role of Jewish women in the Women's March organization. Now, I wasn't at any of these meetings. I'm not trying to referee. I'm not trying to pick a winner or a loser. Because I think that the march in 2017 was a powerful statement, a very broad-based statement of opposition to Trump that was not really partisan. And it wasn't explicit. You know, there were pro-abortion and anti-abortion people at the same march. And so it saddens me to see a movement like that undermined from within. Also, speaking of anti-Semitism, I want to credit Alison Weir at the If Americans New blog. On January 11th, the House voted 411 to 1 for a bill to force Trump to nominate an anti-Semitism envoy, a position that's been vacant since he took office. And their definition of anti-Semitism includes certain criticisms of Israel. The bipartisan bill upgrades the current position of anti-Semitism envoy. You didn't even know we had one, did you? And I didn't either. It upgrades it to ambassador rank, 
which requires the job to be filled within 90 days. The law says the special envoy shall serve as the primary advisor to and coordinate efforts across the U.S. government relating to monitoring and combating anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic incitement in foreign countries. The bill sponsored by Christopher Smith, Republican of New Jersey, has 87 co-sponsors. The only person who voted against it is Justin Amash, the libertarian anti-surveillance guy who's kind of hawkish on the Bill of Rights. And I agree with his position, and I can't believe that every Democrat voted for this. It's easy. You know, it's popular. APAC sends checks. (laughs) <laughs> but this is a real problem, and I'm glad to see that in the Senate, S-1, the bill to codify sanctions against people who support boycott, divestment, and sanctions of Israel, a flatly unconstitutional effort, so far it is stalled, and they've been unable to pass it. Yesterday, the Supreme Court disappointed Joe Hickman, Many of the people who've read his book, and most importantly, tens of thousands of service members who were exposed to toxic smoke emitted from burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan. Those affected and afflicted had sued KBR and Halliburton for their negligent operation of the burn pits. And a lower court ruling in 2018 favored the companies, and the Supreme Court rejected an appeal, leaving the lower court order standing. I have uh, still a couple of copies of Joe Hickman's Burn Pits book, and I'd be happy to send them to new subscribers here at the Peter B. Collins podcast. So if you are motivated by this, all you got to do is take out a new $50 annual subscription at peterbcollins.com. You click on the menu tab, then click on Become a Subscriber, lands you on the sign-up page, and it's real easy to take care of business there. All you have to do then is supply me with a mailing address in the continental U.S., and your bonus book will be on the way. And I have an exciting new bonus offer that we'll announce uh, in about two weeks. The swag just arrived here today. Oh, and I always like to give my mailing address in case you don't like PayPal. You can correspond with me at Box 150 660, San Rafael, California, 94915. Well, a good court ruling came out of a courtroom in New York. And there are three different cases challenging the Trump administration's efforts to include a question about citizenship in the 2020 census. And in Manhattan, Jesse M. Furman, on the bench in district court, said that Commerce Secretary Ross committed a veritable smorgasbord of violations of federal procedural law when he ordered the citizenship question added. Ross failed to consider several important aspects of the problem. Alternately ignored, cherry-picked, or badly misconstrued the evidence in the record before him. He acted irrationally, both in light of that evidence and his own stated decisional criteria, and he failed to justify significant departures from past policies and practices. But the trial court judge, constrained by a Supreme Court decision not to allow him to take sworn testimony from Wilbur Ross, led him to say that he didn't have sufficient effort to prove that Ross had deliberately sought to discriminate, and this tees it up for the Supreme Court to make the ultimate decision, and I bet they will side with Wilbur Ross and Donald Trump. That's just a bet. Well, today's parade of horribles in the New York Times about the Trump administration is based on anonymous sources inside the White House. We're very concerned about Trump's instincts to change the U.S. relationship with NATO. Now, Trump has, you know, he's this bizarre guy who, in some cases, like getting our troops out of Syria, has the right idea, and then he tries to achieve it in the worst possible way. And similar with NATO, his instinct seems to be similar to mine, which is, what's the mission of this 70-year-old organization? We used it to try to encircle Russia after the Soviet Union imploded. That's what led to the conflict in Ukraine. Our efforts to draw Ukraine into NATO and the European orbit at the expense of Moscow is what led Putin to grab Crimea. 
And so, again, I think that Trump has, you know, some notion here that needs to be addressed. But the deep state org in the New York Times closes in with the fiery quotes from all kinds of people who support the status quo. They view NATO as an article of faith. It cannot be changed. It cannot be eliminated. The U.S. must participate. And I'd love to see an honest reevaluation of the U.S. role in NATO. Not just squeezing the other members for more money or, you know, staging war games on the Soviet, the Russian border. I almost said Soviet there. And so we uh, have leakers, senior Trump administration officials, discuss the internal and highly sensitive efforts to preserve the military alliance on condition of anonymity. Which means they are spineless, uh, can I say pussy? Pussies who uh, are unwilling to stand up and say, uh, hey. (laughs) So uh, this is also portrayed by the Times as a big gift to Putin. And it is really scurrilous to see an issue like this subjected to so-called reporting that is not journalism, it's yellow journalism. And it includes so much opinion that it's really hard to distinguish it from propaganda. There's a link to it in the show file for today's podcast. I encourage you to check it out. Now, Steve King is a guy I've been ignoring for years. He's an ugly racist from Iowa. He's an arch-conservative knuckle-dragger. And so it is curious that suddenly his racist comments in an interview with the New York Times last week produced selective outrage from his Republican colleagues who don't give a damn about anything Donald Trump says or tweets, no matter how racist he gets. And so King has been bounced from judiciary and ag committees by the Republican leadership. Mitch McConnell said he should find another line of work. Mitt Romney, holier than all of us, said that he should quit. But they don't say anything about Trump. Apparently, they, they're, they have filters that prevent them from hearing or reading his racist comments. And this creates a problem for the Republicans. Because as they react to King's comments, many people, I think, like me and hopefully you, are raising questions about, well, you know, uh, isn't racism bad no matter who expresses it? Oh, and here's one of the pricey quotes from King. He talked about the record number of women and minorities in the new Democratic-controlled House. You could look over there and think the Democratic Party is no country for white men. Wow. So uh, he is an appalling racist white guy among many in the ranks of the Republicans. But as you can see, (laughs) he's the lightning rod, and the rest of them are just hypocrites. So there's a guy up on Capitol Hill seeking confirmation to be Trump's next attorney general. His name is Bill Barr. He's been attorney general before. As I pointed out yesterday, the corporate media sanitizes his history. They make a passing reference that he was once a CIA analyst, but hey, He worked for Poppy Bush at CIA. He was involved in a lot of skullduggery, the Iran-Contra affair, then the Iran-Contra pardons that uh, Poppy uh, signed off on just before he left office in 92. And it's a real odious, sordid history. And this is a very polite game of uh, parlor inquiry, if uh, I can put it that way. And sure, they're asking him if he'll recuse himself. He said, "Ah, I'll check it out, but uh, I'll make that decision. So he dodged that. Recuse himself from the uh, managing the Mueller probe, to be explicit. When asked about Bob Mueller, his good friend, I don't believe Mueller would be involved in a witch hunt. On Trump, he said, uh, I had a good life. I have a good life. I love it. But I also want to help in this circumstance, and I'm not going to do anything that I think is wrong. I will not be bullied into doing anything I think is wrong. I'm going to do what I think is right. Now, they're too polite to mention who his corporate clients have been at that big Washington law firm where he's been serving. 
or that he was general counsel of Verizon and helped negotiate domestic surveillance with the NSA. No, they're too polite to ask about that. Now Lindsey Graham surfed up a big fat softball and asked him if, at the Justice Department, Bill Barr would investigate Peter Stroke, Lisa Page, and by implication Hillary Clinton and the email investigation. And、uh, he basically said he would. It wasn't explicit, but、uh, that's my interpretation of his answer to Lindsey Graham. And he also defended as entirely properly proper the unsolicited memo that he wrote criticizing the Mueller investigation and sent to the White House uninvited、uh, earlier. I guess it was last year. So、uh, you know, this is just another passive episode. By the U.S. Congress, and we saw the Senate come to life briefly in the Kavanaugh hearings. They couldn't land the fatal blow, and they have less support in the Senate now, with 53, the margin of 53 Republicans. But still, that's what the minority does, and when the Republicans are in the minority, they can scuttle all kinds of things. But too many Democrats are get along, go along, and <laughs> they don't want to. Raise a fuss. Also, I want to recommend over at the Intercept a new reporter. I haven't seen this byline before. John Washington digs into the history of Barr and Jeff Sessions and says that on immigration, Bob Barr has a history of implementation of regressive policies that Sessions did not have. And he notes that back in the late '80s and early '90s, we opened the prison at Guantanamo. To lock up Haitians who are trying to leave Hispaniola to get to the United States, and we did all kinds of shocking things like intercept them at sea and decline to grant them asylum without any, you know, real review, and then we locked up HIV positive people in a separate cage at Guantanamo, and so these are very ugly chapters in American history. And later today, I'll catch up on the hearings of Mr. Barr, but I don't expect that anybody is going to bring up Haiti, Guantanamo, or that ugly history of this Republican <laughs> toady. Also, want to recommend, and I've linked to it from the Washington Post. Elizabeth Holtzman was a member of Congress, one of the youngest who served on the Watergate committee back in the 1970s, and she goes right after. William Barr, for misrepresenting facts of the impeachment proceedings against Nixon. Barr claims that presidents can't be prosecuted for obstruction of justice on a basis of acts that don't strictly involve impairment of evidence. And according to Barr, the acts of obstruction alleged against Nixon were all such bad acts involving impairment of evidence. Holtzman. Barr is flat out wrong. We had numerous grounds for Nixon's impeachment for obstructing and impeding the investigation into the Watergate break-in that did not involve evidence impairment in the narrow way Barr defines the term. And then she goes into further explanation, and she goes to argue later: the Constitution is very plain that a president may be prosecuted for crimes committed while in office. It doesn't hem that provision of accountability at all. There is no language restricting the scope of the prosecution or of the investigation. Indeed, the framers wanted to make it crystal clear that even impeachment was not a substitute for prosecution. Barr's theory is derived from thin air, or maybe not even that. <laughs> well said, Congresswoman. I'm linking to a video report from Naomi Wolf that may be worth your consideration. She says that the Green New Deal, that is promoted by Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and other lefty Democrats, is a mess. And what we have is not a draft bill, but eleven pages of a shareable Google document. And Wolf says that it assigns a vast wartime footing level、uh, level amount of taxpayer money to private entities. Including venture capitalists, the Federal Reserve, new banks, and any financial instrument the 15 members of the committee decide is appropriate.
Wolf continues. It creates a national smart grid, which is terrible for human health and great for telecoms and surveillance. It gives the 15 committee members the right not to hold any public hearings about the Green New Deal if they so choose. It creates loopholes that leaves them free to not have normal term limits. I'm not sure how that can work. It hands vast sums to air and ocean carbon capture, which is an experimental geoengineering tech for which Silicon Valley investors own the intellectual property. And it、uh, says that the Green New Deal will be released on a website and a publication, not on GovTrack, where public transparency is assured. So、uh, these are important questions being raised. Again, I haven't seen a formal proposed bill. So, in some respects, this is speculation about a draft, but it does raise important questions. Yesterday, I mentioned that、uh, Pacific Gas and Electric is going to file for bankruptcy, and they've confirmed that, Chapter Eleven, and the stock market responded by tanking PG&E stock. And to my point from yesterday, the value of the total value of the company is under five billion dollars. The state of California could buy controlling interest for, say, three billion, and hire new operators. The state doesn't have to run the generating and distribution operations. They could hire another utility or create a team of their own. And because the California taxpayer is ultimately going to foot the bill for the liabilities that PG&E faces for the wildfires of 2017 and 2018. To me, state takeover is complicated. It's politically messy, but it's the right move at this time. Chris Christie is publishing a new tell-all book, "Let Me Finish," and he's mainly getting even with Jared Kushner. Now, as you may know, Chris Christie, when he was a U.S. attorney, prosecuted Jared's daddy and sent him to prison.、And、Charles Kushner was convicted of witness tampering. That arose from a bitter family feud, and I didn't know about this detail. The elder Kushner hired a hooker to seduce his brother-in-law, Bill Shoulder, then filmed them having sex in a motel and sent the tape to his own sister Esther. <laughs> These are family values, <laughs> and Jared Kushner argues that that's a family issue that should be between them and their rabbi. <laughs>、uh, that's a book I don't need to read. And finally, today I want to acknowledge that I haven't given enough coverage to the yellow vest protests in France, and I applaud the endurance that they've shown. This Saturday will be their tenth protest, and it is kind of a non-specific protest against the wealth disparities and income disparities that France experiences, just like we do here in the U.S. And it's interesting because, in a piece at the Intercept by Joe Penny, based in Paris, he notes the strength and endurance of the movement, which has no set structure, no clear leadership, and no political or institutional affiliation, has taken everyone by surprise, including President Macron. So it is similar in many ways to the Occupy movement. Didn't have leadership, didn't have a, a political goal or motivation. And so I'm going to pay more attention to the yellow vest protesters, the gilet jaune protesters in France. I encourage you to as well. I've linked to this article at the Intercept for you to check out. And my final question for you today is: Isn't it time for Americans to put on yellow vests and hit the streets? Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. You're free to share it absolutely everywhere. You'll find it on YouTube. And I'm Peter B. Happy trails to you.